Hello, and welcome to episode nine of the Low Back Pain Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Grant Elliott with Rehab Fix Online Low Back Program. And today's episode is all about the benefits of an inflamed disc, why you may want inflammation around your disc or your disc herniation, and why an injection to reduce inflammation or anti-inflammatories to reduce inflammation could actually be a bad idea. Crazy, I know, but we're going to get into it. Before we get into today's podcast, if you are watching on YouTube, you probably notice I'm in a different room than I normally am. The last few podcasts were recorded in my old home. Actually, we moved a couple months ago, so we are recording in a new space. I also have a microphone now. If the audio is better and you can appreciate it and you're watching on YouTube or on uh, or listening on your favorite podcast platform, please give us a rate and review or like this video, subscribe, leave a comment for the algorithm uh, if you appreciate these changes and uh, the potential better view and better audio that you might be experiencing. I plan to continue to uh, upgrade these accessories and these assets to improve this podcast to the best of my ability. And I appreciate all and any support that you might show. So today's podcast is all about disc related things, disc herniation related things, inflammatory related things. Last week or last week's podcast, we had discussed how implementing a particular habit into your day, a 20 second habit could be quite beneficial for maintaining disc height and disc health throughout your day to reduce stiffness, to reduce disc pain, and to improve overall well-being. Where this week we're getting a little bit more into the science of things of if there is a significant disc injury and you are in a particularly sensitive state, what we can do about those situations and some knowledge behind why we want to address these things in this way. So the topic of today covers a study. This study was in 2014 and dives in really deep into the benefits of an inflamed disc or an inflamed disc herniation specifically. So we're still going to break this down in a very simple and applicable way, but we are getting a little bit more sciencey with this one. Uh, for you guys out there that like that thing and appreciate it, let me know. Leave a comment somewhere uh, if you kind of like us diving into these things. But we're going to keep it very, uh, very simple and practical and get to the point as always. So let's get into it. Inflammation is typically seen as a bad thing, right? Oh, inflammation. My back's inflamed. My disc is inflamed. Oh, it's bad. Everybody has a negative connotation with her, with the term inflammation, but inflammation is a natural response by our body, right? We are supposed to have inflammation to a certain degree. I'm not talking about systemic inflammation due to uh, highly inflammatory diets or you know prolonged use of other drugs or things like that. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to the body's initial reaction to injury. Inflammation is designed to help with injury, but we really put a bad reputation on inflammation and sometimes it can be a very, very good thing for us. I know this is not the topic of today's podcast, but we know that ice for, let's just say ankle sprains is not helpful. Um, Ice slows down the recovery of many injuries and we actually want inflammation for multiple multiple reasons, some of which do bleed over to today's conversation regarding disc herniations. So we're going to challenge some thought in regards to what we thought we should do for disc related issues and as for inflammation as a whole. Now, initially, we want to discuss a few different definitions here. Okay. There's three classifications of disc herniations, and this is kind of important to set the ground rules. All right. A protrusion is when the nucleus pulposus, so the nucleus pulposus, we're going to define the anatomy of a disc. Okay. The nucleus pulposus is the inner liquid of a disc. Okay. The annulus fibrosus is a thicker outer rim that surrounds the disc. So imagine a 
kiddie pool, like you, you fill up an inflatable pool in the backyard for the kids to swim in, right? The water inside the pool is the nucleus pulposus. The container itself, the inflated outer rim of the pool is the annulus fibrosus. When you experience a disc protrusion, it means some of the rim, some of the annulus is slightly torn and the disc is starting to push towards that. The nucleus pulposus or the disc material, the disc matter is starting to push through those tears on the annulus and is starting to go towards an outward trajectory. It hasn't gone through, it's gone partially through. That is a protrusion. The next phase is extrusion. An extrusion is where that rim of the pool is broken through, but water is not completely pouring out and completely separated yet. It has gone through, but the disc is still intact. So the disc is still all connected, but it's broken through that outer rim. The final stage is a sequestration or a sequestered disc where not only has the disc pushed all the way through the outer rim, the annulus, but a fragment or a free fragment from the disc has separated from that disc and is maybe laying on a nerve, laying on other spinal structures or tissues is separated and this is known as the most advanced category now i use that terminology reluctantly because what we know is that i don't like saying the word advanced because what we've actually found and what the study continues to show is that the size of the disc herniation the quote advancement of it does not relate to symptoms always and does not relate to the prognosis either. In fact, they find the quite opposite of the advancement of the disc versus the outcome. They find that the greater the disc herniation is, the higher the chances of recovery you have. So typically, if you do have a disc issue and you get an MRI and they tell you, oh, it's really, really bad, it's an extrusion or it's a sequester disc and it's really pushing out and leaking out, we usually think, oh, that's a bad thing. Doctors usually tell you that's a bad thing. We have to address this immediately. But the evidence shows it's not a bad thing. You actually have a higher chance of recovery. So do not be afraid of this. A larger, quote, larger disc herniation does not mean a worse disc herniation. That is not what it means. It is completely dependent on that individual, on their neurological symptoms, on their motor deficits. These are the things that determine the degree of a disc herniation, not the size of it on an image. You do not want to let your care be determined based on what a picture shows. It should always, always, always be determined based on your assessment. And these are things that I talk about with my online clients all of the time. Now, Let's get into it. So we know that the larger the disc herniation is, they tend to regress more. We know the anatomy of a disc herniation. So let's get into the inflammation process and what this paper really discusses. So first off, what tends to happen is you have a PLL. It's called the posterior longitudinal ligament. It aligns the back of your spine. It goes along the back of the vertebrae and it kind of provides a support for those discs so that they don't um, easily uh, push through. It's a little bit of a back support, if you would. And what they found is that PLL rupture, posterior longitudinal ligament ruptures, relate to recovery more than the size of the disc, which is what we just discussed. So more, you know, seemingly more damage, more rupture to these ligaments, they tend to have a positive feedback to the chances of recovery, which is quite remarkable. We think, oh my gosh, more damage means worse, but no, it doesn't necessarily mean damage and it doesn't necessarily mean worse. Now that's just the supporting structure from a ligamentous point of view behind the disc. What's interesting here is when tracking individuals with disc herniations, they found that 
all individuals who suffered a sequestered disc. Remember, this is supposed to be the worst disc herniation. All of them resorbed within nine months. Nine months, all sequestered discs were resorbed, meaning the disc healed. It healed. It went back to where it's supposed to be. The free fragments are no longer. Now, an extrusion, the quote, second worst one, not the worst one, the second worst one, it took 12 months. It took 12 months for majority to be recovered. Now, the protrusion, remember, this is supposed to be the most basic one, the non-threatening one. They actually found no signs of regression. Now, that doesn't mean if it doesn't regress or it doesn't resorb, then it's still a problem because we must remember there are many asymptomatic findings of disc herniation on an MRI. So just because you have a disc herniation does not mean you have a, quote, problem, does not mean you will have pain, does not mean you will have injury in the future. There are many, many, many asymptomatic disc herniations and asymptomatic findings overall with musculoskeletal imaging, especially spine imaging, more focused in the lumbar spine for today's context. So just because there's no signs of regression does not mean it's not healing. It just means it's there and it might not be causing a problem at all. But the point here is that sequestered discs recover the fastest. They resorb the fastest, which is the point of today's topic. Now, overall, inflammation inflammation increases blood flow, right? That's what it is. Swells up, gets all puffy and red. It increases blood flow. Now, that's a good thing, right? Everyone always wants to get more blood flow. That's why there's all these fancy devices out there to try to increase blood flow to different areas, whether it's massage guns or different devices, right? So when there's higher levels of blood flow around the free fragments of a sequestered disc, this can be seen using gadolinium. Gadolinium is a, is a substance used for MRI imaging to look at enhancement of different areas. So when there is higher levels of blood flow, it's always associated with free fragments, which are a result of sequestered discs when used with imaging, when gadolinium is used with imaging or with an MRI. And the higher the gadolinium enhancement, the, the greater that MRI shows this blood flow, the higher the resorption rate. So there's more inflammation with sequestered discs, more blood flow, and therefore they find discs with more blood flow have a higher resorption rate. All good things if you ask me. Now, also what they found is that, and this is kind of a side piece here, is that many individuals with a, quote, bad disc herniation are often rushed to surgery. Oh my gosh, you need surgery right away. You have a sequestered disc. It's a problem, right? Something very interesting that they found is that very early or premature surgery for a sequestered disc or for a disc that is leaking material onto a nerve, obviously that's going to cause pain. We all know that. We, we already know that. Earlier premature surgery can provide rapidly rapid relief because you are obviously removing surgically, invasively, the structure that is causing the pain. But, but in the long run, within that 9 to 12 months period, it turned out to be the same outcomes as conservative therapy or rehab. But the prognosis even longer than that, we're talking one, two, three years down the road, then it inversely transitions to in favor of conservative care or rehab. Because once again, surgery does not fix your movements. It does not fix your habits. It does not fix your mobility, your strength, or any of these things. It does not educate you, but a proper rehab program does. This is why I do what I do and why I've had many clients who have already had surgery where the pain comes back around that one to two year mark. This happens very frequently. The three theories behind this inflammatory process and why we, want, why we might want inflammation around that disc is comprising these three points. One, first theory, is that the fragment, the sequestered fragment, reduces in size due to dehydration and shrinkage of that free fragment, right? It's separated, it gets dehydrated, and it shrinks and goes away. That's one theory. The second one 
is that that PLL, remember what we talked about, that PLL, that ligament that kind of supports the back of the discs, the tension applied by that pushes the disc fragment back into the intervertebral disc space. It pushes that disc back in. So it kind of provides that support, pushes it back in, and that's theory number two. But the last theory is the most studied theory, and that's what this paper is really, really focused on, which is the, we're gonna get fancy here, enzymatic degradation in phagocytosis. All that means is enzymes break down in phagocytosis. Um, these little macrophages come in and gobble up. It's like um, it's like the trash men. Trash men, they come in, pick up all the trash, get that stuff out of there, okay? The phagocytosis induced by the inflammatory reaction and neo vascularization. We're going to break this down. So the intervertebral disc, the disc is the largest avascular organ in the body. It does not have blood flow. It is not vascularized or regions of it are very, very, very minimally vascularized. What's unique here is the nucleus pulposus, the disc itself, is considered an immune privileged substance, meaning the immune system does not recognize it. And this is part of this process. So when a fragment of this disc, when a sequestered disc goes into the epidural space where that spinal cord is, it leaves the disc, that fragment breaks off, it notifies your body, it notifies your immune system that there is something that it does not recognize in a very crucial area, and your body attacks it through inflammation. That's the entire point of this paper, of this topic. So what occurs here is these immune-privileged sites, these nucleus pulposus, the free fragment from that disc that is now in the epidural space that is not recognized by the immune system, it will contain cells from the tumor necrosis factor family. Tumor necrosis factor is a family of cytokines that is involved in major inflammatory processes. So these inflammatory processes, these cells are uh, ready for apoptosis, uh, basically meaning cell, cell death, okay? They're ready for cell death of all these invading cells um, from this free fragment. They're, they're prepared to kill off those free fragments and to get them out of there. That is their job. So these macrophages that are responsible for phagocytosis, they come in and clean up all the garbage, they clean up all the mess that's not supposed to be there. Your garbage cans aren't supposed to be in the street, or your garbage bags are not supposed to be laying in the middle of the street, right? They're supposed to be nicely placed next to your driveway, in your trash cans. So if it's laid out there in the street, you know, not a good place. Someone's going to come, put it where it's supposed to be, get it out of there, okay? That's what these macrophages do. These macrophages uh, contain lysosomes. Lysosomes are collagen-degrading enzymes because majority of your disc material is made from collagen, okay? They're, they're very, very tough structures. So this specific enzyme degrades the collagen, degrades that free fragment that is in that epidural space that's not supposed to be there. So you have a sequestered disc, the free fragment goes into the epidural space, close to the spinal cord or these spinal structures. Your body recognizes it as a foreign body. It recruits an inflammatory process to send cells there to clean it up. That is crucial to understand. Now, what they found is that upon surgery of these discs, when they have surgically removed the disc fragment, that nucleus pulposus, from sequestered discs, that the macrophages found in them or the phagocytic activity found within that is far greater than when they removed disc fragments or not disc fragments, disc herniations of quote, lower degree. So sequestered discs have more macrophages, which clean up disc material than lower grade disc herniations. 
an injured disc itself can also cause um, cytokines to be released even more due to this activity, which is quite interesting because that means they respond to outside stimuli. So your body sends in inflammatory cells to gobble it up. The disc itself will respond to that outside stimuli and recruit inflammatory cells to gobble the process. Mo both regions are working together to clean up that disc because it has an inflammatory process to support it. It's cleaning up that disc material. That's what the inflammation is doing for you. An injured disc, due to this tumor necrosis factor, these proteins that are um, helping the inflammatory process, they will also stimulate neovascularization, creating new blood cells around the disc where blood cells were not normally present or very few to further help the inflammatory process because the more blood flow you get, the better the inflammatory process is. So all these chemical reactions that are occurring due to this disc herniation are helping to remove the disc, recruit all these cells to recruit the disc, and even creating blood vessels where they weren't originally found to increase blood flow even more, to increase inflammation even more, to further enhance this process to boost your chance of recovery and to clean up that disc material. Our body's crazy, guys. Our body knows how to heal when it's put in the right environment, okay? This is a really, really cool concept. Now, what the overall conclusion is here is that inflammation can be a very, very good thing. It can be a very good thing. But when is it too much, right? When should it be stopped? So this is kind of where uh, I'm gonna apply some of my personal experience, some as some evidence-based uh, support as well in regards to when is enough enough. So if someone just injures their low back, just has a disc herniation, they, they're deadlifting heavy or squatting heavy, and they feel a pop, and oh my gosh, they got their low back flared up, their legs flared up, they got symptoms going down, it's been a few days, there's no reason to run to injections to knock that inflammation out of there. Your body needs it. There's no reason to start popping a whole bunch of steroid medications, prednisone or high strength anti-inflammatories. Your body needs that inflammation to heal. That is too early. It's too early. I know it's frustrating because inflammation causes pain, but inflammation can be a crucial part of the healing process. But let's say you are dealing with sciatica for weeks, months, years, which majority of my online clients have. Well, is that because the region is inflamed? Mm, most likely not. Most likely there's other processes going on that are causing those leg symptoms that are causing the pain, that are causing the sciatica, that are not being addressed. If you've had long, long, long standing sciatica, it's not going to be resolved through anti-inflammatories. It's not. Now, let me give you an intermediate scenario. Let's say you've hurt your back and the sciatica has been going on for, let's say, two to three weeks, three to four weeks. And I'm just, I'm just spitballing a scenario here, okay? And you're working with me because I've had to do this. I've had to do this with online clients. You're working with me. We're doing the right movements. We're getting some response. We're making some improvement. But man... That, that flared up disc, that flared up nerve is having a really hard time catching up, having a really hard time catching up, like make a little bit of progress and then we kind of fall back a little bit, make a little bit of progress, fall back a little bit. Well, there, there's a line, there's a legitimate line, okay, where that inflammatory process is kind of preventing you from being able to get to the next level. So in those situations, I will advise the individual to pursue a steroid injection, or a Medrol dose pack, you know, a steroid pack, something like that, or just some, you know, anti-inflammatories they have at home. Those are scenarios where we can utilize those in the short term to our advantage to enhance the program that we're doing to ultimately get them on the right track. That's a scenario, but never within 
a very short period of time. Within one to two weeks, far too premature. Far, far, far too premature. If you've felt sciatica for months and years, I can promise you inflammation is not the process, is not the uh, is not the root of the issue at least. Could you have systemic inflammation from poor movement, poor diet? Sure. But does a disc just stay inflamed and mad for a year straight? No, it doesn't. It can be sensitive. Your movements can be sensitive. Your low back can be sensitive, but it doesn't just stay chronically inflamed because that's just not the way the body works. So the only time I recommend taking an injection or a steroid medication of some kind is in that intermediate zone. Maybe you and I have been working for three to four months and we're having a hard time getting ahead of it. Then, yeah, I'm going to advise you get one of those things. But vast majority of the time, they are not needed. Injections do not help, do not work. Medication usually does not help, does not work unless it falls into those unique scenarios where you want a professional to guide you to know when that would be suitable. Otherwise, you could end up you know, throwing a lot of money towards something uh, that doesn't get you very far. So ultimately, I do not want you to feel as though a bad disc herniation is uh, scary or is a cause for concern or is a rush for surgery or anything like that because this study and many, many other studies as well show that that's just not the case. It's not the case. That is old news And many providers need to be updated on these things so that you can get the accurate information. And sometimes it can be tough. Sometimes you can be surrounded by docs who are just saying, oh, it's really big. It's really bad. You know, you got to have surgery. And that's, you know, why I work with a lot of people all over the world because they're having a hard time finding people who are either up on the evidence or know how to approach these things in a conservative way to once again, teach you how to fix your low back. That's what we want to be able to do. So overall, Inflammation can be a very good thing. You do not want to immediately sprint to injections or anti-inflammatories. Uh, sure, there's a line. Okay, there's there's always specific scenarios or context that has to be applied, but there are benefits to having an inflamed disc, and those were discussed in today's podcast. So that is why inflammation can be a good thing. Inflammation can be your friend. And you might want to let that inflammatory process take place with a proper rehab program, with proper guidance, so that you can get back on track, get back on your feet, get back to doing the things you want to do, and get back to your life at 100% quality so that you don't have to deal with these things anymore. And you can have a clear laid out plan on how you are going to do so. If you enjoyed this podcast and you learned something from it, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, please subscribe, please leave a comment for the algorithm. It would greatly help and share with a friend. These are all zero cost ways to support this podcast and to help continue to increase the production value of it. And also, if you have any podcast ideas, please leave them in the comment as well. I would love to read those and make more episodes on topics that you find most valuable. Otherwise, if you're out there and you are struggling with disc-related issues, let me know if I can help. I will leave a link in the description of both the podcast and on YouTube uh, for an application if you would like my help and you are struggling to find the help that you deserve and you're being told that your discs are bad, your images are bad, and you need surgery and you need injection. That's the only way out of these situations. That is not true a vast majority of the time, and I would love to help you if you are in need or anyone else you might know that is looking for help. Otherwise... Let's continue to learn more about our bodies. Let's continue to learn ways that we can fix ourselves and empower each other to one by one reduce the number one low back disability in the world, which is low back pain. Thank you very much. Have a great day.